You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast. I am your host and narrator, Kate Baker. I hope you are doing very well. This December 2020, issue 171. I hope you're hanging in there. We're almost through the year. It is almost 2021. And I don't know exactly what is going to change with the ticking over of a new year, except maybe hope, a little bit of optimism that maybe things are going to get better, that we're adapting to our new normal, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening to each of these podcasts. Our story is titled No Way Back, and it's by Hai Hui, translated by John Chu. Hai Hui was born in Northeast China. She has been an editor and writer for Science Fiction World, China's premier genre magazine. She has garnered numerous nominations and honors, including a 2016 Chinese Nebula Silver Award, her novel Artificial Humanity 2075, Recombined Consciousness. You can also find two other stories. October 2016 brought you The Calculations of Artificials, and Rain Ship was February 2017. So my dear listeners, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Master Hacker, 11.30 a.m. Hey, Shui Chao, someone's knocking at the door. Aksha puts its paw on my face. I know. I roll over to my other side, pull the blanket over my head, and continue to dream happy dreams. Aksha burrows out from under the blanket, stretches gracefully, and nudges away a few pellets of last night's cat food. Distastefully, it lies prone next to my pillow. There is someone at the door. Xia. Xue. Xiao. I fucking know! I get up, throwing off the blanket. Carelessly, I kick over half the box of instant noodles I put next to the bed three days ago. They scatter all over the place. The room was never large, but now it looks especially small and narrow. I put on some clothes I grab at random and trample through paper and dirty laundry to get to the door. Through the peephole, I see a middle-aged man standing in front of the door. His face is numb, holding no particular expression. He's braced as though he will knock down the door if I don't open it. What do you want? I shout grumpily through the door. I'm looking for... The man breaks off suddenly. He takes a piece of paper from his suit pocket and holds it to the peephole. On the paper is written two words. Master Hacker. There's a place that sells knives downstairs and to the left, I yell back. The door is still closed. I grab two bags of milk and a box of cat food. Aksha runs toward me, its tail high in the air. It stares at me, regards the milk with disdain, and the cat food with interest. For a cat, this expression passes for a serious one. Looking for a master hacker. (sighs) We move out this afternoon, I whisper back. It snorts twice discontentedly and snatches the box of food out of my hand with its mouth. Cats don't like to leave their territory. Our vagabond life means we invariably have to leave before Aksha has had its way with the female cats in the neighborhood. (sighs) Which rat bastard gave away where we live? It grumbles as it eats up milk-soaked cat food. I suck at a bag of milk and begin to throw clothes into a suitcase. I glance through the peephole. The man is really stubborn. He clearly has no plans of ever leaving. With a crash, I throw open the door. My hands on my waist, I stand in front of the man. Are you fucking sick in the head? The man stares dumbfounded. Perhaps chalk-dusted teachers who wear Western-style suits and trousers aren't used to being treated like this, or maybe he expected a cruel, steely-eyed man. His cynical mind jacked into the net rather than a young woman staring back with bloodshot eyes. I'm looking for for a master hacker, he says with a small voice. The door across the hall opens a crack. The retired woman stares from behind with interest, her gaze shifting up and down. (sighs) Something to hack with my ass. 
if you want a kitchen knife, you can use to kill yourself. They sell them in the market downstairs. I don't sell them here. Would you like a rope to hang yourself with? What mental hospital shut down and set you free to go to someone's home to buy a kitchen knife? What's wrong with you? For fuck's sake, scram, you annoy me. I slam the door shut. Inside the room, stuff crashes to the floor out of the corner of my eye. I see through the window the man leave. He seems much older suddenly. Did you track down his cell phone? I gesture at Aksha. One three 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 zero five seven three eight eight five. Aksha lashes its tail. Shang Liang, male, forty eight years old, chemistry professor at G University. I've already recorded his home address and IP address. I stuff clean clothes into the suitcase. I stuff clean clothes into the suitcase, the dirty clothes into a big plastic bag, and toss them both on the bed. The computer case opens in one swift flick. I take out a hard drive and hide it in a pocket. A terse note is left for the landlord, explaining that I've moved out. By the time Aksha grudgingly leaps into the cat carrier, the taxi I called for is already waiting downstairs. One suitcase, one cat carrier, one cat, and one hard drive. This is the sum total of what I'm taking from the nest I live in for four months. Everything else I'm leaving for the landlord, who rarely ever shows up. He might be able to figure me out from this stuff, but he'll have no way to track me down because I'm about to leave for a new place. I'm about to start another phase of my life. It's always like this. My life is split by a series of moves. Sometimes I can even hear the sound of my life slowly rotting in these wrecked memories. My life is an abject mess, unbearably vile. A woman ought to have the serene happiness I absolutely do not have. Obviously, I don't have a husband. Men aren't capable of being a companion to a woman like me, so I have a chatty cat who grudgingly regards itself as a partner in my career as a master hacker. But it generally finds female cats way more attractive. Abyss. Without a whole lot of effort, I find a safe cubby hole in another city 180 kilometers away. The ID I use is my fourth set. A half-hearted effort. It pins all its hopes on being a young woman with a postgraduate diploma. The age and appearance are dead on. After settling in, my first order of business is to unpack my fully tricked out computer and get on the net. The landlord doesn't live here, but his son, before he leaves, earnestly helps me load in and install the computer. His gaze never leaves my low-cut dress. The landlord proudly boasts that his son is a good student. He's in ninth grade and can absolutely test into a good school. My cat glances at the whiskers on the boy's face. They grow up so fast these days. At 2 o'clock a.m. the next day, I link into an abyss. The network has many layers. Some people are content to merely skim the surface, enjoying the virtual images and information electrical brain stimulation brings them. A long time ago, people enjoyed opening doors that were close to them. As a result, they became known as hackers. Then the brain network interface was invented. Some people discovered certain places didn't have doors, but no one had ever set foot there. Stale data, long disappeared records piled up in forgotten corners to the point that they were considered long deleted secrets. We call this sort of place an abyss. Lots of people are happy to work for the government as spelunkers, depending on their piddling skills, to excavate data from ancient abysses and convert them into cash. If their luck is good, they can make a fortune but not everyone is content to be a spelunker. Some people like more extreme methods of making money or more direct means of grabbing money from the government. We call ourselves master hackers. When I'm online, Aksha keeps me company. Anyone who says cats can't go online is an idiot. 20 years ago, people said humanity couldn't go to Mars. 10 years ago, people solemnly swore that there was no way to connect a human mind to the network. Five years ago, people said that cats and dogs couldn't speak. As the facts show, they are all idiots. Although being at the representational layer is like being a stranded fish, placed back into water. Once I sink into an abyss, Aksha astutely stops. It doesn't like these huge distant data spaces hanging out just outside. It guards me against government surveillance programs. Lots of people do not know how to find the abysses of master hackers. They stare at unused servers, idle computers, not realizing there's a kind of abyss that they keep brushing past. The servers master hackers use are always busy. 
especially the massively multiplayer online game databases. We use every trick in the book to set up our own development spaces. I enter the game data from World of Stars. Within a dense fog of calculations, I find the cleverly camouflaged door. A password as obvious as if it were carved into my memory matches a long string of characters like flowing water. The door within the illusion opens easily. I never put any essential programs on my hard drive. The programs a smart master hacker uses are all hidden in the recesses of the network. They serve as the strongest and nimblest extensions of one's mind, radiating like a spider web in all directions. For the same reason, if someone seizes the data within a master hacker's database, that person also has the master hacker in the palm of their hand. To tell the truth, when that man held up the piece of paper with Master Hacker written on it, I practically pissed my pants. The database bears the mark of a break-in. Some are meticulously and ingeniously concealed, but leave some inadvertent loose ends. Others are blatant, but are neatly cut off from its source. No way to trace them. A blast of cold flits across my back. I shudder in spite of myself. An abyss is a place filled with danger. No one gets this. Whoever you meet or the person who spies on you, is a government spelunker, or a master hacker, or is a ghost hidden inside a vast database. Spelunkers and master hackers pass around a saying that you need to understand. Some abysses absolutely must not be tested. Hiding there are vast existences beyond our comprehension. All the jackholes who go there are drawn into a vortex of data forever gone. They leave behind stiff bodies lying comatose in hospital ICUs. Have you found the bastard? Aksha's consciousness wanders over. I'd really rather not. I bring Aksha into the middle of the streaming data. Segment by segment, I unspool it out. Look, these markers are from after we left. They're from government spelunkers entering my database, but the jackhole who left this blatant mark, didn't, did you notice? Maybe he's a newbie, but tidy. If he can do this, then the only... The cat sighs. Aksha brandishes a claw and breaks its connection to the network. I send a disconnect command, too. It's as if my stiff body is being pulled away from a warm pool. Reluctantly, I leave the network and return to harsh, cold reality. Although I feel nauseous, there are some things that are best not discussed in the network. Your point is that there are sea spiders stalking us? Aksha fidgets, grinding its claws against the hardwood floor. Why would they do that? They have to know. We don't have anything to do with them anymore. I'll have to take the job to find out. I fish out the number from the chip in my head. one 373 Chung Liang. Tomorrow I'll have a chat with the university professor. Father and Daughter. Breaking into Chung Liang's personal computer is really easy. At 5 o'clock p.m., he still hasn't left work yet, but I've already worked out the man's basic situation. He has a steady job. His wife died two years ago. His daughter, Chung Wen, is sick and recuperating at G City General Hospital. Before his daughter got sick, he barely had any interest outside of work, but after she was hospitalized, he began to search the network for everything from rumors and stories to web pages and data about master hackers. They practically fill up his hard drive. Aksha takes several pieces of data and digs into the G-City General Hospital's database. We fall into our rhythm working with each other and quickly find Sheng Wen. She's in a single unit ICU with symptoms of schizophrenia. She isn't manic like the other patients in the psych ward. As observed from the monitoring equipment, Sheng Wen is incredibly calm. She lies curled up on the bed. Her large, clear eyes stare at the computer at the head of the bed. According to the psych ward records, Sheng Liang installed the computer for his daughter. Without a computer, she simply stopped eating in protest. The door opens. Sheng Liang walks in with a box lunch. A nurse stands next to him. Wenny? Sheng Liang cautiously studies his daughter's response. Gently, he sets her lunch on the overbed table. She turns her head, meeting Sheng Liang's gaze for a moment. It's not a mad glance. On the contrary, it was too calm, too still for a woman of 19. 
Her mouth opens and closes twice as though she were saying, Papa, without any sound. Wenny, time to eat. Sheng Liang sits beside the bed, opens the box, careful to leave some distance between him and his daughter. Thank you. Courteously, she accepts the proffered lunch and takes a few elegant bites. She uses a knife and fork rather than chopsticks. An odd filling fills the ward. Father and daughter fall silent with each other. She's obviously his flesh and blood, but seems like a stranger, maintaining a polite distance. A fine thread of pain shown mirror-like on their faces. When his daughter finishes her lunch, Sheng Liang repacks the box and utensils he stands. I'm leaving now, Wenny. Oh, goodbye, she answers. Throughout the entire visit, she never called him her father. I sigh, leave the hospital's monitoring system, clean up the traces of my break-in, then leave the network. It's not until now that a headache pierces through my neural shield, making me dizzy and unsteady. I stagger into the kitchen, swallow a pill, and chase it down with a glass of water. Then I sit in front of my computer again. Don't you want to rest a bit? Aksha says. No point, I stare at the screen. I don't need a full connection for what's left. A machine connection is good enough? I can guess what's going on, but what's important now is to make the university professor believe us. Someone who studies too much is easy to deceive. Aksha yawns and curls into a warm ball around my leg. About an hour later, the cell phone tracker signals. Cheng Liang has come home. Remotely, I turn on his computer and print a line of text on his display. Are you looking for me? I guess he must be scared half to death because his microphone picks up a crackling sound and something has been smashed to pieces. I add, I'm a master hacker. You were looking for me, right? Speak. I can hear you. He makes a sound not unlike a strangled goose. I enable speech synthesis on his computer and start typing quickly. On his end, his speaker emits a nauseating, inhuman sound. That should be enough to make someone either hate or fear a master hacker. I know you're looking for me, I say. What do you want me to do? How much are you paying? Who else knows you're looking for a master hacker? He pants for a moment. Once he recovers, I, I want... I want you to find someone. I laugh. <laughs> find who? I, I want you to find my daughter. The university professor seems as helpless as a child. I want you to find my daughter, my uploaded daughter. Your daughter hasn't been uploaded right now. She's at the best hospital receiving the best possible treatment from the neurologists. I laugh grimly. Through his webcam, I can see him back away as if I could bite him through the network. How, how did you know? Because I'm a master hacker, I answer. She isn't my daughter, Sheng Liang shouts. I know she isn't. His hands spasm as they grip the hem of his jacket. I know she isn't. My daughter was uploaded. Who knows what is in her body now? I want you to find money and bring her back. Money is no concern. I want her back. I glance over at Aksha. It yawns and nods its head. I sigh. Just to get this out of the way, I won't necessarily be able to find your uploaded daughter, so I won't ask you to pay up front. I'll wait until I have a lead. Naturally, I'll be in touch. Don't keep looking for another master hacker. Otherwise, I can't guarantee I'll be able to pull this off. Got it? He nods over and over again. His cast is so desperate, it's like giving medicine to a dead horse. For a crime as serious as uploading, he really doesn't have any options besides looking for a master hacker. In that case, I say slowly, tell me everything about what happened to your daughter. On that side of the computer, Sheng Liang chatters endlessly with his head in his hands. On this side of the computer, I light a cigarette and listen quietly. According to the learned university professor, his daughter was always an obedient and well-behaved child, but eventually he didn't know why she became a fan of virtual reality games, wallowing with no way to free herself. He tried hitting her, scolding her, begging her, but none of that worked. Finally, one day she uploaded herself, leaving her father only a brief message. I'm exhausted. 
Living up to your expectations is exhausting. Not living up to your expectations is also exhausting. Dad, Mom, I'm sorry. Goodbye. As a matter of fact, Sheng Wen's story and the story of everyone else who uploads themselves are all basically the same. She was an only child, no siblings, no real friends. Every day, she obediently went to school, came home afterward, ate, then slept. Home and school were the cruxes supporting a finely wrought cage. For the child inside, it seemed like the entire world. Until one day, she became infatuated with the network. I understand the feeling. When you go on the net, information rushes at you like a flood. It tells you that this is the entire world. But when you leave the net, you feel the waters recede. You are still in the cage. You haven't moved even a tiny step. You want that world to enter that world to embrace this brand new heaven and earth. You, however, discover that reality, your body, the love of your family, all weigh you down like shackles in a prison. At a secret upload website, a sentence is written, red boldface on the home page. When exiling humanity from paradise, God said, I will give them love. This is the best yoke. As long as they are bound by love, they will never have a way back to paradise. This has spread among netizens. I don't know how many people try to shout from their cages. They want a new world. Actually, they are confused. A lot of people feel that the price of a new world is to lose everything in the old one. Who would make such a grave choice? But I understand those who uploaded themselves. The reason why you abandon yourself is really simple. Oh, yes. I understand. For example, Sheng Wen. What she wanted was nothing more than comparatively relaxing life. Life where there's no pressure to do well on high-stakes school entrance exams. Another example, say there's a girl named Lin Yu. She uploaded herself because she firmly believed in real life. She had not even one single redeeming feature. On the net, she kicked serious ass. What she did made the relatives who once thought of her as garbage respect her. But they were both wrong. The net is not the real world. They wouldn't open their eyes in the middle of a current of electricity. They just found a piece of solid earth, clear water, and blue sky. An abyss and the net is like an ocean. It swallows everybody who throws themselves in, cleansing them. What very few people realize, the deepest recesses of an abyss are incredibly difficult places for anyone, whether it's a program, spelunker, or master hacker to reach. Huge and dismal existences hide there. It is a place where illegal data, uploaded consciousnesses, destroyed programs, and abandoned AI all mixed together lie dormant, and propagate. Some of the consciousnesses uh, you s uploaded human thoughts as a kernel. Some have only pieces of programs and evolve. They are immense, jumbled, all embracing and yet amount to nothing. They call themselves sea spiders. Governments, of course, know sea spiders exist. They have rooted sea spiders out from their hiding places many times. Sea spiders, however, are way smarter than any program, more nimble than any spelunker, they lurk like undercurrent in the net. Even the craftiest master hacker has hard time detecting their existence. Because they are on the net, the likelihood of self-reproducing consciousness is comparable to that of an infinite number of monkeys eventually typing out Hamlet. As a result, governments have adopted drastic measures. They've banned completely the uploading of consciousnesses, classifying it as the most serious of crimes and giving it the harshest punishments. Of those who upload themselves, 80% of their consciousnesses are ripped to shreds by government web crawlers. 10% are disintegrated into data packets, becoming rich fodder for sea spiders. The remaining 10% become sea spiders themselves, roaming among the data, hiding from both governments and other of their own kind. They rip apart other consciousnesses, to slake their thirst for data. They sniff out, even luring those who want to upload themselves, oh, always alert to take over hollow bodies. But 1% of sea spiders luck into the bodies fools abandon to upload themselves. Those sea spiders return to the real world. They are reincarnated in someone else's body. 
I suppose perhaps at the time the woman called Sheng Wen heard a whisper in the deep recesses of the net that enticed her, called her to go. She didn't know, though, that this first step wouldn't lead to rebirth, but to internal damnation. Sheng Liang's hand trembles as he lights a cigarette. He tells me that one morning he opened the door to his daughter's room to see her in front of her computer, unwakeable and wearing a slight smile. He rushed her to the hospital. The doctor had to tell him, don't hold out any hope for her. Later, as a spur-of-the-moment test, he attached her stupefied body to the network, and she suddenly woke up. But the person who woke was no longer the Sheng Wen from before. Sheng Liang enumerates exhaustively the ways she had different from before. I just let it wash over me because parents always have a keen intuition about their children. I believe him. Since everyone who intends to upload hides at least one sea spider afterward, they hide there silently, luring and agitating. Once the uploaded consciousness leaves the mind, they race to be the first to seize the already soulless body and occupy it. As for the consciousness that leaves the body, her fate is up to 1% opportunity and 99% luck. All she has to do is become a sea spider, then follow my footsteps to become a master hacker like I did. Easy peasy. Sheng Liang said that he received a text. Dad, find a master hacker. Help me. At the end of the text was my address. It was this text that made up his mind to admit his daughter to the hospital. Then he held his nose and went to the neighborhood where I'd rented an apartment. Nowhere to run to. By the time Professor Sheng finishes his endless narrative, it's already 4 a.m. My headache feels like it'll burst my head open. All sorts of random thoughts rush around and expand so that my ears buzz. I take two pills. They help me not one bit. Pissed off, I take three more. I shut down my computer. My hands pressed against my head. I sway into the kitchen and dump some tepid water onto instant noodles. I eat the half-cooked noodles, then return to my room. My bed's not made. The blanket's still unfolded. I plow in, not bothering to take off my clothes and flop into dreamland. It's not until 2 p.m. that I have the strength to crawl out of bed, I rub my face, grab some cash, then shop at the supermarket downstairs. Carrying bags and bags of snacks and cat food, I catch sight of a payphone. A long while passes before I walk to it and dial a familiar number. Hello, may I ask who we're looking for? Mom, it's me. Xu Xiao. Everything suddenly grows silent. Ages pass in silence. My hand trembles as I hold the handset. Not knowing where the courage is coming from, I wait and wait some more. Shu, Shu Chao, where are you? You changed your number again? Mom says, finally finding the words. My job's been transferred to Jiaxing. I lie. I lie like this every time. Actually, I suspect she's long since figured out what I'm doing. Xia, Jiaxing is a good neighborhood, Shu Xiao. Work hard, look after yourself. Mom's voice falls. When... Come on home just to visit? Hmm. Maybe for New Year's, I say. Every time I promise to come home for New Year's, every time I nestle myself in my apartment, cradling Aksha, dry-eyed, I listen to the cold New Year's bells toll. What goes through my mind is that I'm incapable of keeping my promise to my mom. When I return, Aksha sees how listless I am and jumps onto the table. Did you call your mom again? Ugh. Aksha licks its paws. Aren't you just looking to make yourself depressed? I'm happy, I sulk at it in return. If you want to cry, cry, Shushao. Aksha's tone implies a worldly experience undercut by the cat food stuck on its whiskers. Shrugging, I pick up a cash-filled envelope, count two-thirds of the money, then split that in two. You gonna post the money? Oh, like always. Half goes to mom, half goes to Auntie Shu. I hide the cash in a pocket. Aksha licks my fingers with its rough tongue. Don't forget to take your medication before you go. I know. After I return from the post office, Aksha and I gorge ourselves. We demolish everything I brought back from the supermarket. 
Then I sleep until the following morning. On the theory that I'll need a lot of energy and physical strength to look for a sea spider, I take a full dose of anti-rejection medication. It makes me feel like I'm sleepwalking. I shake off my blanket and change my clothes, having skipped combing my hair, washing my face, and brushing my teeth. I eat two eggs, drink a bag of milk, turn on my computer, and go online. Sheng Liang said that his daughter lost herself in the game Rivers and Lakes Unlimited. Moreover, he insisted that I go into the game and look for his daughter's consciousness. Instead, I do something much simpler. I find and follow the trail of uploaded packets on the computer. The trail breaks at the first node. That's not exactly a surprise. On the side, Aksha has already downloaded her game data and began to look for similarly skilled IDs in Rivers and Lakes Unlimited. There isn't any, it says. Scrubbed clean. They left behind fewer tracks than even the craftiest rat. Government databases also haven't captured any records of data packets similar to consciousnesses. Or maybe those records had been deleted, I reply. Where else could there be clues? Aksha asks. Abysses, I answer. The deepest abysses. It's never been easy to find any sea spider, let alone a specific sea spider. Now, there are two possibilities. His daughter became a sea spider herself, or even worse, sea spiders broke up into splintered pieces of data and integrated them into many different consciousnesses. I adjust my gear and begin to search. Know this. Jacking in and uploading feel nothing like each other. To use a particularly fitting metaphor, jacking your mind into the net is drifting along a river in a boat. Uploading your mind, however, flinging yourself directly into the water, you have to master how to see, how to breathe, how to live in the water. Everything you know is turned completely on its head. Before you are swallowed, you have to make yourself a fish. After I think about it, I decide to start from the game. If she liked this game so much, in her ignorance, she might have clutched at this desperate straw when she first entered the world of the net. Heading straight toward the game, I search between the node. The trail broke at the game's server node, not letting even the whisper of a clue pass me by. Clue 1. September 2nd. That's the day she uploaded. Rivers and Lakes Unlimited. District 3, Server 6. A card machine appeared, was forcibly ejected, then disconnected. Clue 2. Server 6 is typically overloaded. Clue 3. A tracking program was once run from here. Objective unknown. The server was located in Wuxi. It was the city I lived in until Sheng Liang scared me into moving. It's here, Aksha says. I dive in deep. The server has a series of storage areas. They are ingeniously scattered across different locations and linked together. As a whole, however, they are difficult for someone to find. In the mine machine interface, I open the door. A range of golden mountains burn my eyes. Red and yellow leaves in a forest, mixed with the green of the pine. Late autumn frost smears the earth with a thin layer of white. The fields have already been harvested. Tall piles of corn lie at the edges. Golden kernels glint against the transparent deep blue sky. Do you miss it? Xia? Xiu Zhao? Do you miss your home? A thin, reluctant voice asks. A young woman walks toward her from a low, flat-roofed house. It's Sheng Wen. With a tiny nose and round face, she is as adorable as a doll when she laughs. Her eyes, however, are black. They are as distant as the night sky and unfathomably haunted. Or perhaps I should call you Ji Chena? She begins to laugh. <laughs> it's been a long time, old friend. Chill? I sputter and spit out the code name. The scenery around me begins suddenly to roil. It changes into countless flows of color like rainbow corridor. Aksha and I are at one end. Sheng Wen is at the other. I've been waiting for you. She laughs and twirls. Her skirt flutters, becoming a beautiful flower. After I downloaded my consciousness into that body, that stupid girl regretted abandoning her body. Actually, she shouldn't have tracked you down. And she shouldn't have sent your address to her father. If she had just continued to hide in that server, the computer I compromised in the mental hospital would never have found her. My heart aches. You stole her body, now you've eaten her consciousness? I ask. 
Oh, don't get all noble on me, her delicate face is ice cold. Are the things you've done any better? How much of you is still Sheng Wen? A lot. Almost 40%, she gestures. With so much data, why would I share it with anyone else? I tore her apart, ate her, and merged her data with mine. It still needs time to digest. I look her over. There's a familiar hunger and thirst in her serene eyes, although every sea spider propagates across the consciousnesses of those who upload themselves. Every sea spider also yearns to return to reality. You want a body that much? I ask softly. You have a body yourself, but you stop others from getting one? She curls her lips. So many sea spiders, they're all looking for bodies to the point of abducting them. When I saw this one, I took it. What's wrong with that? The day you downloaded yourself is not exactly a comfortable one. I laugh bitterly. And yet, I want... I want arms that can hug. I want eyes that can cry. I want a body. I want... She stays silent for a long time. I want to go home. When one sea spider swallows another sea spider, their personalities merge. In that moment, I can't tell them apart. The one who wants to go home, is it the one who has been flowing in the abyss for a long time, who long ago abandoned a corporeal existence, or is it the girl who foolishly rushed into the net with no way to return? It's not so easy, I say. Even if you've stuffed the immense sea spider consciousness into a brain, you'll have to take black market drugs to prevent consciousness rejection for the rest of your life. Also, how are you going to leave the mental hospital? It's none of your business, she says. Suit yourself, I answer. I have one final question that I want to ask. Go ahead. Jill, Sheng Wen, shrugs. Quickly, the nurses are making their rounds. You said you want to go home, but to whose home? Jill Lenk's home in America in Kansas or Cheng Wen's home in Shanghai? She's silent, dumbfounded for a long time. She raises her head then, disappointed, gazes at me with her black, serene eyes. I... I don't know. Satisfied, I laugh. Step by step, I leave this abyss. When it's time for me to break the connection, Jill... Chung Wen's sigh flutters in the distance. Ji, Sina, which home can you return to? A sharp pain pierces my chest. The javelin I hurt her with turned around and penetrated into my own feelings. Fragments of the city of fluttering, thin, light rain in the midst of mansions and skyscrapers and the peaceful village within the range of snow-crested mountains twist together. They remain choked in my throat. Mama, I mutter to myself. I have no idea who I'm calling for. Lin Yu's mother. Or mine. Mother. I was in college when I uploaded myself, a first-class fool at the time. I followed a man I had a crush on into the net. Only then did I realize I was no more than a tasty morsel of flesh. I have no idea what the man's sorry fate was. In the rush of data, I couldn't find any fragment of him or any tracks leading to him. I ran in the abyss, dodging government programs. At the same time, I was hiding from or killing my kind, swallowing their data to replenish myself. She, Sina, was a name I adopted out of convenience, means nothing to me. Just three syllables you squeeze out with your tongue, pressed against your teeth, terse and fierce. Sea spiders almost always break off contact completely with their new bodies, friends and relatives. However, I've heard of those who could return to their former life. I don't know where the person who took my body went. Her trail ends in Australia. I've been very careful, never entering that relatively unfamiliar section of the net. In the local net, for the longest time, Jill and I tangled with each other. We fought, trying to swallow each other. Ultimately, though, we set our boundaries, defining our spheres of influence. No one was more fierce and ruthless than I was. Crazed, I plundered all the data for a chance to return to the real world. In the fight among sea spiders for bodies, though, opportunities were fleeting. Until the day I met Aksha. Aksha was actually small and weak. Compared to our group of sea spiders, it lacked mobility and flexibility. However, it wasn't encumbered by so much excess data. Sea spiders generally retain data about the body. 
ready just in case for that day when they return to the real world. Since it's an AI, Aksha doesn't have any of that. It being in an abyss is like a stranded fish returned to the water, as if it were a rat aside our big elephant feet. It told me that it wanted a body. It, however, wasn't compatible with human bodies. I think I have a solution, I said. Let's make a deal. When a new consciousness emerged confused among us with Aksha's help, I detoured around the chaotic fight. I penetrated directly into the empty brain. The rejection response is more violent than I'd imagined. For a week after getting the body, I lay in a hospital bed, mournfully wailing through my mental and physical trial. It wasn't until Aksha brought me a fragment of consciousness it snatched from the net that my condition improved. Two days after I left the hospital, I found an excuse to leave the family, a woman called Lin Yu. From the black market, I stole a huge supply of anti-rejection drugs, an upload-download unit, as well as a yellow cat whose intelligence was augmented by a microchip. Since then, I brought Aksha along. We began our roving days. In these last few years, in my pocket is invariably hidden a letter. It was written by a mother to her daughter who was already never going to return. My dearest, you... It has been so long since I've heard any news of you. Mom knows you're doing your best out there, building your career, but since you can't come home for New Year's, you're never home at all. I miss you. Your father also speaks of you. You're an adult now. You should find a man to marry. This year, why don't you come back to Pudong for a short visit? Don't make us worry. You don't need to send us so much money. Your father's and my pensions are enough. Mom. Shu Yun. 2075, January 26th. I raise my head. In the mirror is a healthy woman, wrinkled pajamas wrapped around her, unkempt hair, bluish black eyes, a small mole dots the corner of my mouth. Every time I look at myself in the mirror, I feel strange. It's as if Lin Yu's family in Shanghai, Lin Yu's mother, her taciturn father, not to mention the Shanghainese, I understand not one word of, they consistently warn me. I'm actually a thief who stole someone's body. The day I left Lin Yu's family, her mother opened an umbrella and saw me off to the end of the lane. She already realized by then that someone else's soul occupied Lin Yu's body, but she still smiled. She still tried to convince the incomplete likeness of her daughter to stay. She sent this letter four years ago to my first address. I moved immediately after. Drifting about, I never heard any news of her. I never write my address on any money order I post. Frequently, though, I see the silhouette of her going from house to house knocking on doors, and I have no choice but to sneak out the back door in a rush. The Lin Yu who uploaded herself, the fragment I received of her, is actually not very large. In my bones, I am still the sea spider, Xin Shu Xiao. My mother is still the woman waiting in a small town in the Northeast Forest District. As for Lin Yu, I received her body, but not a way to love her family. Return home. Return home. New Year's Eve, I carry Aksha with me to the train station. There's a missing person notice stuck to the station entrance. It rustles in the breeze. Missing person notice. Sheng Wen, female, 19 years old. Wearing a cream-colored sweater, white overcoat, black jeans, long hair, wears glasses. Disappeared on 2079, January 6th. I hope a good-hearted person will provide a clue. I hope my daughter will return home. Father Sheng Liang, weeping. 2079. January 10th. Speechless, I study the grainy picture printed on the notice. Sheng Wen's smile gives one a feeling of distance, yet another sea spider who didn't realize until after returning to this world that there is nowhere to leave for, but also nowhere to return to. I laugh bitterly, holding Aksha. I board the train back to my hometown in the Northeast. The hometown I left six years ago looks just like it used to. Tiny towns seem to freeze in time. 
Only the people who live in them slowly grow old. Clinging to a thread of hope, I plucked up my courage to return here. Auntie Shu and Shang Ling, they could realize someone else's consciousness lived in the body of their child. On the other hand, can my mother pierce through her in you exterior to see what I used to look like? Even if she hugs me, will she still call me Shu Shao? I put on my overcoat and pick up Aksha. The warmth of its body gives me a bit of courage. Just give it a go, it says. Hmm. I leave the hotel. The harshest northeast wind carves my face. On the road at the edge of town, my mother is waiting for her daughter to return for New Year's. I muster my courage and walk toward my mom. It's been so many years since I've seen her. She's old now. Her thick down jacket seems empty, wrapped around her gaunt body. She is curled up against the cold wind, a pair of cloudy eyes stubbornly facing front, waiting for me to return home. I'm back, Mom. I walk over and I keep walking. Her gaze slides past my body. My steps grazed her. What she sees is an unfamiliar woman carrying a cat. Who I brush past is my mother. The wind and snow flutter, turning heaven and earth pure white. My mother and I are two tiny black dots on the white ground. The more I walk, the farther I go. The more I walk, the farther away I go. I don't know how many bodies carry other people's souls. I don't know how many mothers wait in vain for their children to come home. You have eyes that can shed tears, but not necessarily eyes that can cry. You have arms that can hug, but not necessarily arms that can hug the people you love. This has been originally published in Chinese and Science Fiction World, May 2006. It's translated and published in partnership with Storycom. And I invite you now to go to the Clark's World magazine website itself to leave a comment on what you thought about this story. Or you can go to the About Us page and send us an email. All of our contact information is listed there. Thank you so much for listening. We have a few more stories left for you for the month of December, and then we hop into a brand new year. I hope you'll come along for the ride, and I hope to see you then. So until then, I bid you a very fond and warm and hopefully very temporary farewell. <laughs>